Uh, Pooja, uh, if you can hear me, uh, let me know if you can. If you could just uh, check on the links that you sent out uh, an email, send out another message if you if you uh, if you're able. Um, check, make sure the right links get sent out to people. Okay, and then um, yeah, right link was in her earlier email today. It was in her earlier email. Okay, good. Yep. All right. And so I'm, I'm on Zencaster, and so is Tim, and so are you. Okay, perfect. Oh, you guys are on Zencaster. Oh yep. man, thank you for reminding me. All right, let me uh, let me get that started. And and then actually, I'll I'll let people in so we can have some have some fun getting them all in here. Welcome everyone. Let's see here. Disable the waiting room. Yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome to hey. Piano Tech Radio Hour this week. We'll, uh, we'll be getting started in a minute here. Happy Saturday, kids. Yeah, happy Saturday. We're sort of getting to the point where even though we've had to deal with quarantine, you know, the summer's rolling around, it's kind of nice. People are cautiously getting some fresh air and uh, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's terrible weather here in Southern California. Uh, 69, sunny, light breeze. It's <laughs> terrific. So right now we're waiting on Tim uh, Tim Barnes Tim's to, back. to jump Tim's back, back here. Oh, he's yeah. back. Okay, cool. And actually, I'm just going to make sure that this... Let everybody in. Yeah, I'm going to make sure this audio recording gets started here. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, perfect. All right, I'll check past. Hi. Okay. Out of there. All right. All right. We're ready to go. So, uh, give you guys a little bit of an intro today. Uh, Reminding you, Piano Tech Radio Hour is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclass. It's an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. Find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And on today's episode, we have Tim Barnes. He is a serial piano industry entrepreneur currently running two successful companies. Well-loved Piano is a solid company known for a team of skilled piano technicians led by Tim. His second company is Gazelle Network scheduling software for piano techs. In addition, he is a seasoned piano tuner, author, teacher, entrepreneur, and leader among PTG members. He is based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Tim, welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Thank oh. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. I'm just going to take a minute and say that Tim and I had known each other. Hi, Tim. Hi, David. Until it was Austin, wasn't it, Tim? Austin, I think Texas. It was, yes. A regional, a regional conference in Austin, Texas, and we just resonated deeply at that point. I went to his class. He went to a class of mine. It was just wow. Who's this dude right here? And it turns out that he's <clears throat> like a mainstay of our little community, and uh, really a, a fabulous human being. In addition to being a savvy business person and a really good piano technician, so. Really a pleasure to have you here, my brother. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, so, David. So I'll, I'm just going to kick us off here uh, with, with some questions to kind of get the ball rolling. And if any of the, any of the peanut gallery here, the audience, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I, I'm actually personally curious. I hope other people find this interesting. Just about your journey in the piano industry. It's not that common, you know, maybe that's a small percentage of all piano technicians get into sort of doing some sort of business to uh, support the industry. So I'm curious, like how, how, how long had you been tuning pianos? I know you went to business school. What's the timeline to where you said, hey, I want to start and nobody, we didn't mention it. Your first, I think your first business, you might have something before that was Barn String Covers. So how long were you a piano tech before you decided you want to do something entrepreneurial in the industry? 
Yeah. Um, so my first business uh, was a lawn care company in central Florida at 11 years old. Um, I ran that for six years. I had a string of folks all up and down the block. And I chose that over playing ball um, because by the time I had the chance to play ball, uh, I was actually making some serious money. You cut the grass twice a week in Florida. And so nice. in the middle of summer. And so that was actually my first business. Anyway, so fast forward, I was 17, 18 years old. Uh, my family relocated to Raleigh, North Carolina, a little town called Fuquay, Verena on the south side of Raleigh. Oh, what? And a Fuquay, Verena. Um, it was a hot springs way back in the day, and it was nothing when we moved there. Uh, it's now a suburb of Raleigh. But um, anyway, so I had started taking up an interest in piano, you know, when I was 14, 15, 16. And moving to Raleigh, I had no friends. I had no desire to be in Raleigh. I had just left Central Florida. I loved it. That was home. And I threw myself into the piano. Oh. And I've always been somebody who uh, would either turn a wrench or figure things out on my own. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to figure out how to tune this thing. It needs to be tuned. And so I broke out my dad's toolbox and, you know, found some things to work. Anyway, long story short, three hours later, my piano sounds worse than it ever has in its life. I mean, I'm hearing noises come out of this thing. The, I couldn't even describe it. It was so bad. So I finally gave up and looked at my savings account and decided that if I spent 50% of what I owned, I could get it professionally tuned. And it was now worth it to do that. So I called a technician out. He came out. I watched him for like three hours and just in all. And at no part of me was thinking, I want to do this as a career. I was just watching him going, you fixed what I couldn't fix in three hours. And it took you about 40 seconds what did you just do? Abby, so he had me hooked. And so a conversation ensued after that. And so I was in high school and just decided, you know what, I want to learn how to service my own piano. And pretty quickly, I realized this is not like a, a five minute hobby. This is something that's going to take some serious dedication. And that's when I started learning that there was actually a opportunity to pay college tuition if I could spin this up in the next two years, I could actually pay college tuition, work in servicing pianos um, and basically go to school. And so that's really what brought me into the piano service industry. And so then I went off to college uh, here in Charlotte and I've been here ever since. Uh, started a business through school, uh, ended up graduating, uh, did a little bit of music, but uh, ended up graduating with an economics degree and rolled out of school, had the good fortune of servicing the piano for the number four Bank of America as a junior senior economics major in college. Wow. And so while all my friends are going and getting internships at the bank, I'm sitting there thinking, hold on, I know one of the top executives by name and I'm gonna be in his living room next week. I'm not putting a resume together and putting it through the front door, I'm just gonna go ask him what kind of internships I could get. And so I did. And he bent the this direction of my life that day and just basically said, I've, Tim, I've been with the bank 30 years and I've hated every day of my career. Before you go wow. into banking, it seems like you love what you've been doing because I was you know, working as a piano tech, paying college tuition. It's like, it looks like you could make a living doing this. Could you? It's like, well, I've heard stories of some really great piano techs making some good money. Uh, I think I could. And he was like, here's the deal. Next Wednesday, it was a Wednesday. So it's like, next Wednesday, uh, I'm going to write you a letter of recommendation. And I'll hand deliver it to anybody you want in the bank. You tell me the department, I'll give it to them and you'll get the job. But I want you to think about this for one week. If I woke up in your shoes and I had the chance that you have in front of you right now, I would literally kill to have that opportunity right now. Wow. So he said, think about that for a week. And if you want the resume, I will give it or the letter, I'll give it to you. And that's so we, I, that's what I, I'm a little bit concerned. He was going to kill someone to do that. Well, was I was, I got kill? out of there pretty quick because I wasn't <laughs> sure if I was on the list. No, he and I are friends now. And um, so but that's, what, that's what you can call a hinge point moment. In your yes. Life. Yeah, it really um, was. 
where and, things turned on an axis. You know? Yep. Yep. So I started Well-Loved Piano. At the time, it was Barnes Piano. Uh, I'd been doing it for about four years, but really, emotionally, I started it that day. I decided this is going to be my career. And wow. once I made that decision, it changed the course of the decisions I made after that point. Um, because I was no longer just ho-humming around, you know, making things work. I was much more intentional, um, still had no clue what I was doing, no clue how to do it. I had a long road ahead of me, but it didn't matter. I had a vision and I had purpose and I was going after it. So, um, so anyway, to, then fast forward, I started a string cover company just because I could not find, I was selling string covers to my customers and I didn't have a great supplier or a great experience with the existing suppliers. And so I thought, how hard could it be, right? Uh, you get some wool, you learn how to sew and you put them together. So I bought a sewing machine, learned how, taught myself how to sew, taught myself how to fix the sewing machine. Uh, and that company, I ran that company for six years and uh, it eventually got to the point where I'd hired uh, somebody to make the covers, uh, had patterned up hundreds of different pianos and we would just pull the pattern out and make the cover. Uh, it was really a high quality product. It was a lot of work, a lot of fun, but the company just didn't have the potential that it needed to be uh, viable long-term. And eventually the gal who was making them came to me. It's like, Tim, just so you know, in 18 months, I'm doing this life change and I'm on track to do that. And so I kind of knew that that company had a uh, end date unless I was going to sew the covers or unless I got somebody else to do it. And it was a pretty complex process that she nailed down at that point. So I didn't know it at the time, but a year later was really when we founded Gazelle. And um, both companies were really born out of a pain point in my own company. Uh, so the string covers was born out of a pain point. And as well-loved piano grew, there was a lot of pain in managing a growing piano service company. Uh, I, by that point, I had multiple people working with me and organization was an issue. There wasn't great software to do that. And for the last five years, I'd been trying to solve this problem and I couldn't. And so uh, that's when I ended up getting connected with Luke who left the Silicon Valley software world, just fed up with the corporate model. And we just decided to attack this problem together. And it was really in that partnership that, you know, gazelle it exists today uh, i had part of the vision luke brought the ability to execute it project manage it and get it off the ground in a successful way um, and so that was five and a half years ago now uh, so for the last five and a half years uh, i've it was another hinge point for me because you know we now support piano technicians in 30 countries and, uh, you know, so I've got the team at Well Loved Piano I support, and then I support Piano Techs through Gazelle in 30 different countries. And so, you know, I'm, I've had to really mature and develop and grow as an entrepreneur, uh, as I've had to ask at different stages of my life, you know, what's important now? What am I going to be doing in 10 years? And what do I need to be doing now about that? Um, so that's the five minute version of how I got from a high school kid cutting grass in Florida to where I'm at here. Great. A follow-up question to, you know, as a good transition, you talked about thinking about 10 years ahead. We did have a question in the chat uh, from, let's see, who was that? I missed it. I'll say in a second, but they were just curious, you know, what's your, what are your thoughts about the future of the piano industry? And we've talked to a few people about this over the course of our episodes, you know, nobody really knows, but um, it's interesting to hear a perspective of someone who, you know, sees it from an unusual vantage point. Yeah, yeah. You know, here's how I look at it. A um, hundred years ago, the piano was the centerpiece of entertainment in the home. Everybody played, right? But it's not that way anymore. The radio, television, and eventually the internet caused all of this to change. But what's true about the people who choose to own a piano today is this, they invest more money, time and passion into this part of their life than the average person did decades ago. So, you know, there's really two ideas that I've had to wrestle with as I've 
basically built my entire career on this niche small industry. Uh, the first idea that really uh, was foundational to me being able to uh, progress as a piano technician was just this idea of art. Uh, as I had to answer the question, why would I invest my entire career in this niche industry that from the outside, everybody is like, but people don't play the piano anymore. And so it's like, okay, well, the people that do play it at a higher level and demand more from the piano than they did decades ago. And if that's true, then I need to approach this like an artist who's selling boutique art to a small group of people. And most people try to define art by the end product that's produced. But if you consider the idea that art is actually the production of something that can't be replicated, yeah. it's the idea of just starting with a blank canvas and creating something from nothing. Uh, it's the act of producing something original that has value and is appreciated by someone. And because the act of producing something from nothing in and of itself is original and can't be replicated, then as a group of piano technicians, as an individual piano technician, uh, we all fall into that category of artist if we choose to measure our success by something other than the end product we produce. And if that's true, then it doesn't matter what industry you're in, an emergency room nurse doesn't produce art by checking off a chart. They produce art by choosing to sit a few extra minutes at the end of their shift with a patient who is scared. The chart can be replicated the care they provide to somebody who needs it can't. And this, I, I heard that idea from a guy named Seth Godin and immediately just realized, okay, this applies to me and everybody in our trade. It's good to focus on making your product better and doing it more efficiently, but it's even better just to take your eyes off of the piano and also measure your success by whether or not you look for ways to give people who you interact with daily something of value that cannot be reproduced. Oh. And because this is what they will remember when they think about you, that's what they're going to think about when they think about inviting you back into their home. And so that first idea, like when I think about the piano service industry today, it's like, well, that's why I'm a piano technician. That's what I'm trying to achieve. And that's what I achieve when I go into people's homes. So it actually has nothing to do with where the industry is at. I got plenty of work because they're inviting me into their lives because that's true about the experience I give them. And you know, this, is, this is reminding me of something that I've, I've heard of referred to as the wow factor in terms of just any type of business, even if it's a product uh, related business, um, but especially in a service related business is that it's just that, that, that sort of extra little things that someone does as a business owner that can really make the difference in having a successful business. And the example I've heard of is somebody brings someone in, you know, it's a sales you know, meeting or something, they're trying to sell them a certain product, but you know, they, they bring them a, a soda, you know, and they, they put it in a nice glass and they, you know, it, it's just like little things, in it, but it creates an experience. And mm -hmm. I think that, that, it's interesting that you say this because I think, you know, both David and I are also think about this. It's like, we're not just there to kind of know how to, I mean, we can just be there, but I don't know that it's the best way to be there to show up, you know, be there more than just to kind of turn the pins and, and get the, get the piano in tune, create an experience for the, the client, both in the moments that you're there, as well as, you know, creating a sonic experience with their piano where they kind of feel like this is something special. Yeah. So I, I really like the yeah. way you put that. Yeah. yeah. The, so that was kind of like the first way I would think about it. The second idea is just really simple. And this is as much for me as anything. And it's the idea of just aspiring to become the best technician in your area. Right. When you marry those two things together, you become a dynamite technician. Right. And what's great about both of these things is they're both choices, not an end product. So today you could actually walk away from here if you just picked up a tuning lever yesterday for the first time and decide this is who I want to be. And that choice 
to produce art and aspire to be the best in your area will alter the rest of your career and calls you to attain more than you could have otherwise. And so whether or not you're just learning the trade, you're middle of your career, or even at the tail end, uh, those two ideas coming together for me are the reason that I, when people ask me what I do, I tell them I'm having more fun in my career right now than I think is legal. There you go. So I'm just gonna bring a real time example of this exact thing. Got a call, my website drew in this guy uh, who lives south of me, who has a 1985 Hamburg C. It's a, it's a, that's a German Steinway, seven foot, six inch piano. And uh, hadn't been, he couldn't find, he said, I, I found you and you sounded great. I couldn't find anybody like you for a long time. So the piano hadn't had anything done to it in like 20 years besides tuning. And so he was, I proposed two days of work and rebushing the keys and changing the felt on the, the other felt on the, on the key frame. And he was like, well, how much is that going to be? And I told him and he said, geez, you know, that, that's a lot of money. And I said, well, I'm going to take this piano from about 55% efficiency to about 95% efficiency. And he said, yeah, but I like the way it sounds. I said, uh, my friend, you just have to trust me. This piano can sound in another realm than this right now. So we got done and uh, my partner sent me a, uh, a, a little film of him playing the piano. He said, turns out he's a surprisingly good player. And then there's this audio of him saying, man, I should have trusted you from minute one. This is like, this is like playing heaven. I didn't realize what I was, I didn't know what I didn't know, he said. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ta-da! Yeah, so. And uh, what I f felt in that moment was the art was me catalyzing this profound feeling from him. Yeah. In him that, wow, my piano is really a great piano. I thought it was a good piano, but now I know it's it's a great piano. Yeah, so about a year and a half ago, it wasn't a Steinway Homburg C, it was a 1980s Kimball console. <laughs> and my client had arthritis and had basically started playing, fell in love with it. And one day she told me I'm having more and more issues and I just can't play as much as I like. And I said, listen, let me regulate and voices for you. It'll make it easier to play. Oh, no, 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 no. Anyway. Fast forward a year, she tells me, I've decided to stop playing. And knowing that she didn't really have the budget, it was a huge purchase for her. I basically sort of just said, listen, same thing. It's time for you to trust me. And now two years later, she's still playing. And every time I show up, she's teary eyed at the fact that she's still playing. And it's that is one of the most fulfilling Kimball consoles I've ever worked on. And I've derived more pleasure from that experience than I have some really nice pianos. And thankfully, I also have a lot of Steinway Homburg C stories too. <laughs> so that's that's the high end of the piano business. When you can bring somebody some joy and some value. Yeah. That's the high end. That's great. Yeah, I, I've I've had similar experiences um, where yeah, where you, where you kind of just let someone know that that you, they could do better, or, or just even finishing up a piano that that they you know had all intents and purposes of you doing some work on from the very beginning, but they actually didn't realize how good it could sound after doing that work. Um, I think that's always a that's always a a really great example when you get a client that says, "I didn't know this piano could actually sound that good." Yeah, and and I would say this, you know, uh, we have a lot of you know, top pros on this call. And I'm sure a lot of people know this, but, but for anybody that, uh, that is, hasn't become aware of it is, is that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the capacity of their piano. They've, they've kind of resigned to this is how it performs kind of like your situation, Dave, oh, this is, I like it this way. This is how it is. You know, I've gotten used to it. And, um, 
we know, we know what they're capable of. And so if we can show them, you know, sometimes there's a fear that they won't appreciate it. And, you know, it's the exact opposite. A lot of times they think we're some sort of magician, you know? Yeah. The key is getting them to see the problem. And so when I've, what I've realized works best is just to walk up, evaluate the piano and just say, your piano is built for this level of performance. It's not performing at that level. It's actually performing right. here. And as soon as you introduce that problem, you get a moment of their full attention because their brain is actively trying to seek and resolve problems. It's what our brains are hardwired to do. And so I just say, you know, piano was built for this level of performance. It's currently performing here. Now we, we can do this level of service, which I recommend because based off of everything you told me and the music that your child's playing, this meets all of your needs. We could do this lower level of performance, but I don't recommend that because it's not gonna meet your needs. And if you suddenly decide to start playing eight or 12 hours a day, I'd recommend this level of performance because it gets it all the way up. Tell me how you would like to service your piano and what kind of performance potential you wanna aim for and what kind of questions you have. And they will process the information very quickly and start asking questions. And very few people go with the bare minimum when you introduce the problem that way and just say, I recommend this, I don't recommend this, and I conditionally recommend this. And I've had a lot of people who are average pianists say, well, um, I want to become a better pianist in the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the whole hog now and do what David said and just get it up to the 95% efficiency. Um, I'm not despairing the current condition, tone, touch of their piano right now. I'm just saying it's built for this. It's currently here. I can make it better. That's right. And there's, there's two crucial factors before you even get to that point. Number one, if you show up, bring in the problems that you had before that appointment, money problems, relationship problems, whatever problems, you're stressed, you're worried. If you bring that into the door, those people are gonna be confused because human beings can read, woo, read your atmosphere pretty darn well. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a book, called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell proves that mm -hmm. beyond a shadow of a doubt. So that's number one. Number two, if you tell yourself a story that, oh, they're just going to want me to tune it and they can't afford anything else and yada, 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 your usual grim speculation about the future, it's, you, 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 you're going to just tune the piano. So understand that how you come into that situation and look, they have people in their house all the time that try to upsell them for things, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to really show them by your state of being that you're not that person, right? You're not that guy. This is not where you live. And once you do that, by being like a doctor or an educator, they're like, oh, this guy's, this, this person is really sincere, right? This person is not jiving me so. yeah yeah there's so much science that goes into the way our brains work to process information and at the end of the day if you deliver the right information to their brain in the wrong way they get confused yeah and if you confuse you lose and so so much of what i've tried to do is simply to say, listen, I, I understand pianos at a level 10, they don't. How can I deliver this to them in a way that they have the information they need to make a decision? Uh, and usually that means explaining it on a level one or two. Right. And when you explain it to them in a the way they can understand and they can identify the benefit and the risk of doing nothing, it, in their own mind, they, they decide what they're gonna do. And That's so, idea. yeah. Do you use car analogies? I do not use analogies. Um, so Gazelle just released an estimate feature uh, that puts all of this into application with pictures. So I actually just show up, I have a graph now 
where when I do an estimate at the top of the estimate, it shows them a chart with your piano's bill for this is currently here and here are your three options. And then every estimate is fully put together for those three options right there. And I'm prepared to either talk to them about it right there in the home or email it to them and let them talk it over with a spouse or significant other. Um, and so I've basically just automated a lot of that. So 98% of my time is spent focused on producing art inside the relationship with my customer. Oh, I've basically true. taken the idea that uh, you hired me to understand pianos at a level 10, not to teach you how to understand pianos at a level 10. And so I'm just gonna say, I, I know exactly what your piano needs. Here's the options, tell me what you need and let's come to uh, you know, an agreement on what is gonna be the best path for you and make sure your questions are answered. And then all of my time is spent interpersonally getting to know the client, building trust, talking to them, looking them in the eyes, uh, I found car analogies, sports analogies, all these analogies tend to distract and confuse, really? you lose. Wow. I've, I've had massive success with car analogies, but I keep it super simple. Yes. You know, yeah. um, tuning is like gas. You know, other maintenance of this machine is like plugs, points, you know, timing, you know, change the belts, you know, it can't, the car can't run just on putting gas in it. It just won't. Oh, that's it. I don't go into parts and, you know, well, this is like this. I don't ever do that. Just, yeah. you know, a big, the big picture, you know, yeah. tuning. Guy Schuster has a, has an interesting comment on this. He says, I love car analogies to explain regulation. I describe tire wear. Mm -hmm. You don't really notice tire wear each year, but after six years, if you if you uh, put new tires on, suddenly you can steer, drive, and brake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my uh, my personal experience has been that I, when I was young and immature as a technician, I would spend way too much time talking about the parts inside the piano. Yeah, and analogies were better than that. And when I started using analogies, I got better results. Uh, what I've since come to learn is that they're actually not necessary. There's a higher level of connection with the client and understanding where you can just simply explain the problem to their piano, show them where it's gonna perform, ask what level of performance they want. And then I answer any question they verbalize and they verbalize the questions that are important to them. And if the conversation is led in the direction and they say, so is this like, changing the tires on my car. Well, yes, then I'll pull the car analogy out, but it's actually the client drives the questions, not me. And so I found that that's just been far more effective for me. And do you use show and tell? Do you have some quick way of softening the, 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 the attack of a note to show people or look, can regulate one other notes that make an all kind of noise and stuff? in about yeah. two minutes and, and do that? What's really interesting is a lot of people, a lot of people, me included, used to put pack all that at the front thinking the client needed that to make a decision. Right. They don't. It's actually important information, but they make the decision and then that information comes out. So a lot of times what happens is I say, you know, I, my whole uh, uh, presentation is about 40 seconds. You know, I evaluate the piano, I smile, I show up, pull my tools out, look over the piano, figure out the dynamic range, the condition, all that stuff. Hey, Sally, can I have a moment? Okay, great. Your piano is built for this, currently performing here. I recommend this because it meets your needs. I don't recommend this because it's not going to meet your needs. And if, you know, here's the conditional recommendation I have. What questions do you have? And, you know, what, um, and what level of performance do you want to shoot for? Then I shut up. And as I answer their questions, all that information always comes out, but they actually already made the decision to do the work. And so it's in the context of, I've already decided to do the work. Now, can you show me what I've bought? Instead of let me show you what you're gonna get to help you decide. That's fascinating. 
That's awesome. And so the conversations I have with clients, I mean, some of them just hang over my shoulder for hours while I do the work, just amazed. You know, some of them don't, they leave the room, but uh, they're just like, okay, so you told me you can prove the piano. That's great. Now I'm really curious. And they just start peppering me with all the questions I used to try to pack at the front of the presentation. So all that comes out anyway. It's just, when do you present it? And I present it when the client asks about it. Another nice add to this is, uh, which I found useful, is to always be thinking and aware of and questioning to find out what is the perspective of the, the client? How do they view the piano? What, what do they actually want to get out of it? Uh, so I did an interesting experiment. Uh, I think I had like an intake form on my website and I just threw a question there, optional question. Why do you want to get this piano tuned? You know, and these are people who already wanted to get it tuned. It was very interesting, the variety of answers, you know, so somebody might say, I have perfect pitch and I just cannot play an out of tune piano. Okay, so that's yeah. one type of person. And when you're, t when you're talking to them about tuning their piano, you've got to talk to that person. And then somebody else, they might say something like, I just want to give my kids the best experience. I know nothing about music at all, but I want to make sure that they have the, you know, the finest equipment that they can so that they can excel at becoming a great piano player. Okay, well, that's a totally different story. Nobody's got perfect pitch, maybe the kid does, but the person that you're kind of engaging with around the work and all this stuff, you have to talk about it in terms of who they're really thinking of, you know? And I, there were yeah. just, I think I collected 50 or so different stories, you know, and they're all unique about why, why do people want to work on their piano? Why do they want to make it better? Why do they want a piano tuning? If you just ask a few questions to find out what really is important to them. And then when you frame what you're doing in terms of what they actually care about, as opposed to just these generic things like that you care about, you know, I'm a piano yeah. technician, everything's got to be tip top shape. Okay, yeah. great. But they may not be thinking about it that way. They might just, they don't care thinking, about I just want, yeah, exactly. They don't, they don't care. They don't want to know unless they really do want to know. They don't want to know about why this does this and why it doesn't. Professional players don't want to know yeah. that stuff, yeah. mostly, so, unfortunately. Um, you just have to, as Tim said, and as Ethan's saying, you have to be like a doctor, like a good doctor, like a healer, mm -hmm. you know, who, who doesn't watch the clock, who answers questions, who asks questions, who really is like, obviously proves again and again, wow, this woman is really interested in me and my piano. This man is really, you know, they're doing a great job. They're a pro. Yeah. Trust. Trust is hot. Trust yeah. is moving. Trust is active. Trust is the greatest thing you can have. It's the basis of all business. Yeah. The, the information that Ethan was talking about is so critical to get early in the conversation. So when I show up to a client's house, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a new client or a returning client, I need one thing to be true. I need them to believe that I am going to be able to improve their piano and meet their needs. No. And if they trust me on that front and they believe that, then when I walk in the door, if you think about where I'm going in about three and a half or four minutes, I need to tell the client, uh, based off of your trust in my ability, my ability, and my assessment of your needs, the music on the desk, what you told me you need, what Ethan just said, why do you need this done? Based off of all the information you just gave me, I need to be able to tell them confidently, I recommend this level of service because it meets your needs. And so the idea of art there is that the art I produce is I listen intently for their needs. I understand their needs and I see the needs that they don't verbalize. Oh, and when I, I get all that information, now I'm able to use my understanding of a pianos at a level 10 and simplify it down and just say, listen, I heard everything you said. I'm here to say, this is what I would recommend because it meets your needs. If I didn't care about producing art and listening and all those other things, I'd never be able to say the most important thing. It would just be, well, your piano needs a lot of work and here's three things you can do. 
And, this, that's and, not and, an and, and which one of those approaches is more intrinsically attractive to your being? Wow. It's a no brainer. Yeah. You know? On that topic of understanding the, the needs of a very specific client, um, I'll call out Carl Lieberman, who's here and who was a guest on a previous episode. I had a chat with him the other day. And he was talking about what's the key to maintaining, or in his opinion, what's the key to maintaining these institutional relationships, you know, hotels and schools and things like this. And in those cases, he said, they do not want to think about this at all. <laughs> you know, this is a part of their job that they only take care of, you know, once or twice or three or four times a year. And you, they'd rather not even do it that much. So if yeah. you could show up and say, hey, this is what I'm going to offer you. I'm not going to explain to you all this stuff. And I'm not, you're just not going to have to think about it anymore. How does that sound? You know, yeah. and now we'll have a contract. I'll come in. I'll take care of what needs to be taken care of, when it needs to be taken care of. And you, you can take care of your other business. That's yeah. a very interesting situation. Then you're a superhero. Yeah. You really are because you're, you're, you're taking stress away. You're not adding stress, right? Yeah. Yeah, the uh, exactly. when you make it easy for people to do business with you and you make it easy for you to run your business and do business with yourself, a lot of stars align. And the difficulty of the, the whole idea that confuse you lose and if you make it difficult, people aren't going to do business with you applies in every area. And uh, so I've focused the last, you know, five years, it's been about a five year journey. Uh, five years ago, I realized I was making it too difficult for people to do business with me. And I thought I had my ducks in a row and I was doing a pretty darn good job. The problem is I, I did business with a company and it was so smooth and so easy. Every step of the way, I actually got the CEO on the phone. And this is a $50 million company. And uh, he, I, I, what happened was I hassled his employees enough that one day my phone rang and he said, Mr. Barnes, this is Mr. Jenkins. I hear you want to talk to me. <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a call. And in the next 20 minutes, he just blew my mind. And he said, listen, for the last 30 years, I focused again and again and again on just making it easy for people to do business with us. And then he said, and I started here and then I went here and then I went here and then I discovered this was difficult. So I did this and I'm sitting there going, check, 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 check. Those, that explains the experience I just had. No wonder I had that wow factor. And I looked at my business and I went, check, check, nope, nope, check, nope, nope, nope. Oh shoot, I've got a really big problem. And so that was about five years ago. And I've spent about five years just going through every area and just saying, is this too difficult? Yes. How can I make it simpler? Make it easy for people to do business with you. And then the benefit was it became easier to run, build, grow my business. Um, Tim, what's the percentage of piano technicians, just, you know, guesstimate, that really not only know how to do the work to make that striking positive change in the piano, to take it from 55 to 95 or 65 to 95. Um, well, that's the first question. What do you think the percentage of our entire community in, let's just say the United States, what is there, 4,500 or 5,000 piano technicians practicing probably? Yeah. Um, I tend to run in circles with people who can get it up at the level you are. And so, but I, I will say this, the rule of thirds applies so many areas. I don't have hard facts, but I would just venture to guess that 30% of piano technicians out there understand pianos at a level 10 and can do what you and I do in the time that you and I do it. 30% of piano technicians out there understand it and can do it slowly. They're just inefficient. And 30% of people out there just don't care. And I, I say that because in so many other areas of business, I've run multiple businesses in a lot of different areas and studied a lot of different industries. It always applies. If you don't have data, and I could spend a thousand hours interviewing every piano technician in the world. And I guarantee you, like maybe not 33%, but maybe like 32 and a half or 31% of people understand it at a level 10. 
and maybe 35% just don't care. And the other 27% or whatever in the middle, you know, understand, but aren't efficient. It would probably break out to about one third, one third, one third. That would be my guess. Uh And let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is the terror of raising prices, you know, and, and how crazy it is that you make less than a plumber or a computer repair guy that's been doing it, you know, for two years out of college, right? Yeah, um, I have had the privilege of being the most expensive piano technician in the entire country for a period of time. And I've also backed off of that a little bit um, as I've shifted the business model a bit because I was no longer, you know, me being the freelancer there, but we're still top of the market in every market we're in. And uh, I've had to go from charging way too little to charging adequate prices. What I discovered was there was an incredible tension that emerged. Everybody always told me, raise your rates, you'll never regret it. And I would say for the most part, they were absolutely right. What they didn't say was that if you raise your rates too fast and don't change who you are as a person or a technician or grow your skills, you can get this discongruency where you're actually charging more than you're worth. And as I raised prices, I went from charging less than I was worth to charging slightly less than I was worth to charging slightly more than I was worth. And then when I made another jump, I realized, oh shoot, I've got this tension now and I, I resolved it not by lowering prices, but by becoming a better technician. Yeah. And it's that tension where I could have been, um, I, I could have chosen to stay comfortable. But it's that was scary. A, I have to it, say it it's, it's scary. Yeah. And I think that's what holds people back. You know, it's like, uh, I've heard it, you know, cause I put the word out about different things and I hear things back from various people. And I think, there's this definitely this idea of I charge more and I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, gouging prices or something, right? And then, of course, the the response that actually, for some reason, a lot of people don't think of well, is you're not gouging prices if you do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but but then then that actually presents another sort of existential crisis is, you know, how do I do a better job? And each time that we've raised prices in Floating Piano Factory in New York, and I discuss it with the, the technicians that are part of the team. I say, you know, you may not feel like you're, well, first of all, you deserve this. You know, you deserve this um, because you've been working hard, you've been progressing, you have experience and you care. You know, we care, like you said, we're part of that one third that knows what we're doing and we care. We're not the part that like doesn't care. But also if you're uncomfortable with how much you're charging, you can add things to what you do and and you have liberty to do them now. And it's not just that you have to be um, improve your skills, you know, that that's definitely a piece of it. But as long as you're always thinking of how can I make this worth it for that person, whether it's, you know, bringing them a special gift when you come to to the tuning or just uh, maybe you're acting as some sort of a a connector for them or connecting to them to someone, you know, who could be useful, a piano teacher or something like this, or, you know, a great example with your company, um, Gazelle, um, not to be too salesy about it, but if you're, if you're providing this sort of efficient method of booking for people, right, then it makes sense for you to charge a little bit more because you're providing this level of service that is higher than another person might, you know, they can just go to the website, they can just type in what they want. It offers them um, a great idea of when they could fit into your schedule. They don't have to call, they don't have to spend hours on the phone, right? So they're they're getting an extra value out of that. And that's actually worth a little bit more on yeah. your, your yeah. prices as you, as, you, uh, as you go out and you charge. Yeah, you know, um, the, the idea that, uh, you are going to sell a product or a service and your price should either reflect the value you provide people, or if there's going to be a discongruency, you want to be on the side of providing more value than you charge. Because if you're ever charging more than the value you provide, you get into hot water and you don't have a functional business model. 
Uh, and so, you know, when I look at the different businesses that we have, uh, well, let's just start with the piano service business. You know, I was freelancing, uh, charging more. And, and because of where I was at in the industry, I actually was intimately aware with what a lot of high dollar technicians were charging around the country. And I would look at it and go, yeah, my tuning price is like lockstep with where you're at. But they would tell me the stories of what they charge for a job or whatnot. And I would be like, yeah, but I walked in and I charged four times that for the same work. And huh. it's so it's, you know, a lot of it was, well, I don't include that, 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 and that in whatever I do. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm walking in there and I know that on the face of it, our tuning prices are close, but I'm walking in and I'm just more effective at selling for a higher profit margin, these services, partly because I'm not selling the service, I'm selling the end result is you're going to enjoy your piano more. Right. And so anyway, but you know, so that was true, but the same is true as in Gazelle, you know, we've got five years of data that shows in the first 12 months, revenue grows 41% for the companies that are using Gazelle. That's five years of data. And as we continue with estimates and all these other features that we've added around it, not just the scheduling, automated reminders, being able to do text message automated reminders, you know, that number actually grows, it's not shrinking, uh, simply because as we've made it easy for people to build and grow a business, we've made it easy for them to actually focus on producing art and doing the things that allows them to earn more profitable, do more profitable jobs, charge higher services, or just be more efficient and save time. All of that has an impact on revenue. And so if, you know, the, the key, the takeaway though, is just to stop what you're doing and ask, is the value I'm producing at, above, or below the product or the price point that I'm offering? And if you can honestly answer that question, you're gonna know what your next step is, whether you need to raise prices, double prices, or whether you need to hold steady and focus on improving the value first and then raising prices. Um, so it's not the always as clear cut in my mind of, you know, raise, 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 raise. There's this tussle, tussle back and forth of you raise prices, you improve value. Now values above price. So you adjust price, um, maybe slightly above value. And now you work on value again, and you're constantly oscillating between these two as a good business owner. The one thing I would add to what you're saying is that, um, the value you are providing is dependent on the client and what that client values. Um, and so it's another factor to think is yeah. part, part of the issue of not uh, providing the value might just be that you're, you are providing value, but the client doesn't value it. So it, that's another piece to remember, uh, you know, like a beginner pianist or someone who just needs the piano tune because they're having a party and they don't know anything about it. You know, you, putting in a lot of extra work and, you know, and doing all these things, they, they don't have the mindset where they will pay for that. They just don't. They'll say, uh, you're too, you're too much for me. Right. And That's then, exactly right. Right. And then if you, but if you, if you find and connect with the clients who value what you do, then they don't have any problem with the prices because it, it's valuable to them. You know, That's they're, right. They're Somebody, Somebody said to me a long time ago, and I've used it ever since, almost as a mantra, common sense is uncommon. <laughs> yes. So if you roll into a, into a new client and they're like, there's the piano, I'm going to leave the check here, tune it. And you then waste your time by trying to get into something else when they obviously have decided this is the piano, this is the tuning. Now, if it's below pitch, you can then, you know, charge more. But you've got to use your common sense. Yeah. Uh, you can tell what right as you walk in the door in the first 10 seconds, is this person going to, you know, be engaged with me about this instrument? Do they care about this instrument? Is it, you can tell all that almost instantly. So don't waste your time and energy trying to, educate somebody who doesn't want to be educated. That's called pearls before swine. 
Yeah. And, you know, they're not swine, but you know. Yeah. What yeah. yeah. You know, it, but that's where uh, listening and understanding and allowing the client to drive the questions and drive the conversation is so important. Oh, Cause if you take Ethan's example of the furniture owner, who's having a party and doesn't either care or understand, you know, I walk into that situation and I say, listen, you have a professional level piano that's performing on a beginner levels uh, as a beginner level instrument. We've got a huge gap. Now, um, you know, here's my recommendations. I recommend this for this reason. I don't recommend this for this reason. We could work on this for this reason. I've had people say, well, the pianist I have coming for my Christmas party at the end of the month is this level of piano. So I want to get it up to this level here because I'm not going to be embarrassed by my piano. And the money wasn't an issue. I lost that sale 10 out of 10 times for the first eight years of my career. Because, because I made an assumption when I walked in. And so when I started letting the client drive the questions and drive the conversation, uh, that was the moment when all of a sudden I started hearing these things and going, oh, okay, so what does it take to get it up to that level? Well, uh, it would require this work, this price. And they go, do it. Can you get it done by this date? And I'd say, well, if you're going to do all of that, I can make it happen. <laughs> That's brilliant. So I'll just uh, cut in here. We're almost up to the hour here. And uh, wow. I just want to let people know we're wrapping up. I don't think we missed a lot of questions. And I was a little bit worried that we we're missing some questions, but a lot of that was comments and people kind of affirming and telling their own stories along the way. So hopefully um, we didn't miss any big questions that people had. Um, and uh, Ian here is putting some uh, links in the chat. So if you, uh, if you want to give some feedback, we really appreciate it. It helps us improve. And that link is in the chat right now. And then there's also a link if you are interested in signing up to support Piano Tech Radio Hour. It breaks out to just about $2 per live episode, but then also you're going to get all of the recordings of all of our previous episodes in our member area for just eight dollars a month so uh, if you have the means for that i know it's a tough time if you have the means for it go for it and we really appreciate it, it helps us put things together and on that note um i will just share my on my screen here really quickly finally put together a little representation oh, wow. of everybody here on the team uh we've got um is that this is the other people that are supporting what's going on right now um here we got Mikolai. he's in poland um, we've got Pooja, she's in India. We've got Tal, he's in the United Kingdom. He's from Israel. Um, Ian's living in, the, in London as well. Um, and the three last people are part of a floating piano factory team, but they also help us out here. That's Patrick, Daniel, and Sarah. They've been helping out with, um, you know, just general production of the event. And as I promised uh, earlier, we're going to be releasing this as a podcast. So when you get back out there and you're jumping around from, tuning to tuning your car, you can just, you know, put it on your player and check these uh, past episodes out. So they've been working on the podcast editing as well. So um, they make yeah. it seamless. They make everything seamless. Yeah, you, yeah. You, really much appreciated. Really much appreciated everybody helping out. So before we go, I just want to say a huge, massive shout out to those men and women who are kind of regular viewers of uh, Piano Tech Radio Hour. I'm just, I'm, I'm filled with gratitude that you show up and that I see your faces and it's like, wow, this is part of my community. This is, these are, these are my kind of humans. And uh, that's all. I just, I'm feeling very grateful right now for this, uh, this little community let this little community. And of course, we are all filled with gratitude that you're here, David. Uh, anybody who wants to give a shout out to David, he's, uh, he's really doing, uh, he's, it's really great to have him here as a partner and showing up every week and being a consistent uh, source of inspiration for all of us. It's, uh, it's just magical to have you here. Thank you, so thanks man. a lot. Yeah, and David, a couple of years ago when we first met, yeah. I'm still trying to apply some of the stuff you taught me. And it has been a pleasure just getting to know you over the years and Ethan watching everything you're doing between piano technician masterclasses, 
these radio hours. Uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun watching all of this come together. So thanks for having me on today. It's been a pleasure. Our pleasure, brother. Truly. Very um, good. Thanks for making it. All yeah. right. Well, uh, we can pretty much wrap up. I'll start uh, logging things off on the on the social networks and everything. And we'll close down the, uh, the Zoom chat in just a minute here. All right.